Welcome to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast. And before we get rolling here, we are moving ahead of schedule on the horary class, and we are hoping to release it on the eclipse. That's our goal. We'll keep you posted. We will have a special launch episode on the day that we do get to release it. Everything is coming together and we are on schedule, so we're anticipating Thursday, April 20th for the release of Robert's Signature Horary Course. And I got to tell you, this thing is absolutely amazing. Robert is so in his zone as a teacher, and it really comes through in this nine-part course. We'll tell you all about it when it gets here, but just know it's coming. All right, we're going to get into our normal routine here of episodes. This will be interesting. person called in and had a question about natural zodiacal order in the chart. So what if your first house, your ascendant, is Aries? Is there anything significant of that was her question. So, Robert, what do you say? Well, I'm, I'm confused about the, the, the word significant. I mean, that's so vague in general. If you have a, a sign rising, that becomes your chart ruler, that sign. The sign on your ascendant and the planet that rules that sign on your ascendant is your chart ruler. It is your life ruler. So when you have Aries rising, Mars is your life ruler. And then Mars becomes the position of Mars in that chart by house, by sign, by aspects. That becomes the, the most significant planet in the sense of being your chart ruler. Now, it doesn't supersede the sun or the moon. It doesn't. So when you say significance, the significance of the rising sign is it's the lens through which everything else is filtered, both coming in and going out. So everything for her or for anybody with Aries rising is going to be processed in terms of how does this affect me, 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 me? If you're not careful or unconscious with Aries rising, and it depends on where Mars is, of course, but Aries rising can be an incredibly selfish sign. I've got moon in Aries, so talk to me. Aries rising is all about what can I do? What can I do in this situation? How does this affect me? So it's a very personal and and also um, a very critical way to live. In fact, not critical in the sense of criticizing people, but critical in the sense that with Aries rising, everything can become a drama. Everything can become a crisis on the negative side, or everybody, everything can become joyful, even though. So there, there tends to be this immediate reaction to life and people and situations with Aries rising. Uh, and it can also be very Im Im impatient, as Mars tends to be. So those are, you begin to get a, a series of guides to pay attention to in your life if you have Aries rising. Let's say you have Mars in a fire sign. Um, as compared to Aries rising with Mars in an Earth sign, Capricorn, for example, where Mars is exalted, then suddenly you've got a terrific Mars, at least to start with, because Mars in Capricorn knows how to control its actions. Uh, so the significance of the Ascendant is paramount, really, in the chart, because it describes the kind of life the person will lead. And with Aries rising, it's going to be a Martian life, which can be wonderful. Uh, but you'd better be pretty active, either intellectually or physically or both. And you better be uh, the kind of mind that is enthusiastic about the new offerings that life brings you rather than fearing change. Aries tends to instigate it, if nothing else, because it bores so quickly. It gets it. It's a very fast learner, Aries rising sometimes. It's also a surface sign. It takes immediate uh, responses to stimuli, in other words, as opposed to signs, let's say, like Taurus rising, which is a little much less impulsive and impatient and will take its time to assess the situation. Aries rising tends to have an immediate impression of the situation or the pub or the person or whatever it is and to react accordingly that may be great especially in times of war for example if you're a soldier if you're a police officer aries is associated with those sorts of professions and there they demand quick reflexes and quick responses so it's appropriate in other situations it wouldn't be if you think about the ascendant as sort of a lens through which your entire life is focused, both incoming and outgoing. 
And then you begin to study your Mars or whatever planet rules your ascendant and its position by house and sign and aspects and so on. Then you have a really detailed picture of how you filter everything that comes into you and how you filter everything going out. So in terms of Aries risings, it, it's very much about what can I do here? And it's meant to be, Aries is meant to be a self-aware, self-involved sign because it's it's the sign of the newborn, the sign of the infant. And somebody with Aries rising, even if they're old souls and they have the sun in Capricorn, let's say an old soul sign, even if they're old souls, they have Aries rising, they're going to treat everything that comes to them in this life as like a newborn. Look at this. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at her. Oh, look at him. So they're enthusiastic in that way. And unfortunately, one of the negatives that depends on the Mars, again, if it's got negative aspects, is that Aries rising can get very enthusiastic about people, places, and things. And then fail to follow through because it's found something else to get excited about. So sometimes, again, that depends on Aries. If if you have Mars ruling Aries in Gemini, then you're likely to be a lot more impulsive than if you have Aries rising and you have Mars in Taurus, let's say. So that's, I guess, the significance, I hope anyway, that I'm trying to clarify for Thomas. Yeah, you know, there's so many different ways that we can go with this. So let's take it this way first. She was asking a specific question about if you have your chart structure where Aries is your ascendant, so that is the ruler of the first house, Taurus is the ruler of the second house, Gemini is the ruler of the third house, and so on. So I'd like to just focus on this question on the second house, because Venus then is ruling the second house, Taurus, in this natural zodiacal order. Does that mean that they get more money in their life? <laughs> Not if Venus is afflicted, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, so I'll tell you, Thomas, this is such a great question, because one of the ways that I, I still think about the horoscope is that the signs on the cusps are like scripts for those house matters. So if you have Taurus, which is the natural sign to have on the second house, that's the builder. The natural inclination with Taurus on the second house, and look, you may, if you have Aries rising, you're going to have Taurus on the second house. The natural inclination with Taurus is to build, to accrue, to save, even to hoard sometimes, but it wants to build security, financial security for itself. That's the ideal. Uh, with Taurus on the second house, then you have to look at the ruler of that house, Venus. See what kind of a sign it's in. If it's in a sign, a spendthrift sign like Gemini, for example, then uh, yes, it's got Taurus on the second house. And that sign shows you that person's conditioning about money. And that's the same house that rules self-worth, the second so the sign on your second cusp gives an astrologer a description of that person's belief systems about their self-worth, which then translates to the physical world as money and material security. So that's the belief system. Now, if Venus, the ruler of Taurus on that second house, happens to be afflicted, then you're going to have money problems, and you can de define what those are by the horoscope. Is this making sense? It is. And what I'm getting from this question that this person asked us, too, is that you really don't get any special cosmic bonus, bonus points or bogeys for having <laughs> being having your chart in the natural zodiacal order. That's what I'm getting from this. It's just that that's where they are, but there's no extra bounce or boof or whatever. I don't know what the term would be extra oomph from having them in the those in that particular order is that correct well i guess so if i'm understanding because in the natural wheel which begins with zero aries and has zero of each succeeding sign around the, the wheel aries taurus gemini that's the natural sequence of life you're born, you come out head first and let your reach birth baby. So you come out with the crown chakra, that's Aries, the top of your head. 
So that's the first thing that we experience is Aries. The second thing in the natural wheel is Taurus. We the second, first thing we realize once our we're out and the umbilical cord is is cut, and somebody spanks our little bottoms, and maybe we make a, a crying sound or something. But so we're hearing our voice. We're we're sensing whether it's hot or cold, and light or dark. We're coming out of the womb after nine months, and then we discover we have a voice, and we. We have a physical body and we can feel things and sense things. It's hot or cold, it's wet or dry, and we have hands. And So that's now we're into Gemini. So the order of zodiacal sequence is the natural order of human development. Unless you have Aries rising, you are going to be out of sync with, quote unquote, the natural wheel. And so what you can think about is, okay, in the natural wheel, you have Taurus on the second house. Good. That's about being very practical and very uh, security oriented about money. Save money. Make more than you spend. All of that. So that's the net. But if you wind up with a sign like, say, Aquarius on the second cusp instead of Taurus, the sign of Aquarius is a big collective sign. It's also a sign ruled by Uranus, which is nonconformist. So you know already with somebody with Aquarius instead of Taurus on the second house is going to think about their self-worth in an entirely different way from somebody with Taurus on that cusp. The person with Aquarius there is, t- is going to, their self-worth will tend to be based on their intel- intellects. It's an air sign and their ability to mix and mingle and enjoy a wide diversity of humanity throughout their lives. So they they have a far less personal relationship to money than, say, someone with Taurus on that cusp would have. You see the natural sign versus what's actually there in the timed horoscope. So you're constantly thinking in that way. Uh, The signs on the cusps tell you the person's belief systems about those house matters. And it tends to vary from the natural wheel. Most people don't aren't born with, well, one-twelfth, I guess, of them would be born with Aries rising. You know, you and I were talking before we started recording here about another piece of this that just would be an interesting uh, embellishment here is to talk about something I think we have talked about before, but let's bring it up again. You call it the developmental arc. Would you weave that into this narrative? Oh, I would be happy to. I discovered this, I'm sure, in a book somewhere many, many years ago. It's to simply list all of your planets, the sun, the moon, the ascent, the midheaven, and all the planets. List them in zodiacal order, starting with the earliest degree and going up until the, the last point. You can include your part of fortune if you want to, any point you want to. And what this developmental arc gives you is the order from earliest to latest degree of the signs. So the planet in earliest degree, whatever it is, is how you start everything. Now, let me let me just add, because I'm hearing all these questions that people are screaming right now into their phone or whatever. <laughs> so you don't you ignore the sign and you just go by the degree and build no, a sir, list? No, sir. No, oh, OK. Sir. You OK. Ignore explain. The sign, but you list them in zodiacal order. So, for example, simply because I know this one by heart, I'll, I'll give you mine quickly. Uh, my moon is at three degrees Aries. All right. That's the first planet. The next planet in zodiacal in zodiacal order is my Venus at four degrees Scorpio, right? About, all right. So and the next and so on. So you're listing them, but you do add the signs. But what happens is now you have a list that I I call the developmental arc. Um, all right. Let me just ask because I'm I'm hearing these sure. questions echoing in my head. Okay. Then what do you do about the dual signs? So Virgo, Scorpio, Aquarius. You just list them in order. So I've got the moon at three degrees Aries. Venus is at four degrees Scorpio, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Pluto is at nine Leo. Uh, Saturn is at 10 Cancer and so on. So so it's not you you include the signs, but what you're really focusing on is the zodiacal order from degrees. So you have the planet in earliest degree, which starts your developmental arc. And mine happens to be the moon in Aries. So my initial reaction to everything is moon in Aries. It's very selfish. It's very self-centered. It's how does this affect me? That's if something's coming in. Or what can I do about this situation? But what I do, and I have to be aware of it, is I have an 
instant moon in Aries and childish, immature moon at three degrees Aries, emotional response to everything. If I'm not careful, Thomas, I would respond to life like a three-year-old because of the degree where my moon is. It's that that cut and dried with this stuff. So now I'm aware of something. You mean I've got the emotional nature of a three-year-old? Yeah, Bob, you do if you're not careful, if you don't look at And it's true. It's true for me. So I've learned a lot from that. So in order of, of uh, the planets, if you take them in zodiacal order to form your developmental arc, Think about the transits. When Jupiter, for example, enters Taurus, it's going to start triggering those planets in that order. It'll first make, you see, it's going into Taurus. So it's going to first make an aspect of the moon. And then the next aspect it'll make will be to the next planet in my developmental arc and so on. And finally, the last, the planet in latest degree is how I end everything. Now, in my chart, the latest, the last, the latest degree is my midheaven. It's not a planet; it's a point at twenty-eight degrees Libra in my tenth house. And by George, it has been true with me all of my life since I was a kid. What can I? How can I make a career out of this? When I was a kid, I used to, <laughs> I used to. Well, first of all, I used to uh, stage uh, uh, shows. You know, for the neighborhood kid. I mean, these were full productions, uh, <laughs> and charge uh, charge a nickel. Since birth, I'm this way. Everything that uh, that comes into my life, ultimately, I want to know: Can I make a career out of this? Can I make money from this? How is this going? Do you see what I mean? So, this is my pl- my point in latest degree. So, uh, my focus in life has always, always been a career. My career. And it's worked out beautifully. My career is very Libra and Scorpio, very Mars and Venus. The astrology career, for certainly, because of the metaphysics and Scorpio and so on. And also the career as an actor, even, when I went out to Los Angeles to do that, which I did do for about three years. That's artistic and so on. That's all that Venus-Mars stuff, Libra and Venus and Mars, all that theatrical stuff. So, and then when I became a television writer, career, career, career. And I've followed my bliss, my horoscope. I have Taurus, the sign of money, the sign of talents, the sign of self-worth. Taurus on my fifth house of creativity. And the ruler of that fifth house is Venus in my 10th house. And there is my career and so on. So that's how you're beginning to read these things in zodiacal order. And what happens, Thomas, for example, once you're born, the moon transits the entire zodiac in a month. So it in the first month of life, the moon's transit has triggered every one of your natal planets and points in that order, in that zodiacal order. Mars comes into a sign. It transits in aspects to all of those same planets in zodiacal order. Every planet that transits does this. So over and over, starting with the first month of life, that developmental arc sequence of the planet in earliest degree or point to the planet in latest degree gets repeatedly triggered over and over and over. It takes one year for the sun to transit all that stuff. So in the first year of life, the sun will have triggered all of those planets in that developmental arc in order. And during the first month of life, the moon does it. So at 12 months, one year old, the moon has triggered that developmental arc 12 times. It begins to get built into your experiential DNA, that sequence, from the moon to dune to dune in, in order. And you can begin to see how this developmental arc, if you list them out in paper, and begin to think about them. And so you can begin to get a lot of clarity on how you live your life, really. What's the first thing you think of? And I have an emotional response to everything. I've got moon in Aries. So, and if you're not careful, because the moon in Aries on the negative side can be a really selfish sign, totally selfish. Now, I don't think I was ever that. But I I am certainly a Moon and Aries guy. Uh, so you can begin to learn 
learn a lot about your responses to life. Plus, if you have them listed like that, you have an instant chart that you can you look at transiting Mars. Where is it today? Oh, it's right there. Oh, it's about to. You can see it in the list. So if things begin, when things begin, you can also get sequences from that. Just looking at where the transiting planets were when something began. See what planet in your developmental arc that transiting Mars or transiting Jupiter is triggering. So it's a really invaluable little tool to just take the time to list your planets and points in zodiacal order and then begin to look at them from the standpoint of transits triggering them, solar arcs triggering them, and so on. Okay, I want to make sure that people are really clear on this. So I'll put both of our charts in the show notes And by the way, guys, if you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to comment on Apple Podcasts or on iTunes if you listen on that device. It would uh, help us move up in the rankings there, and we could expose more people to the show. So just a quick little favorable uh, response, if you like what we're doing, would be greatly appreciated. Show notes will have Robert's chart and my chart as well. Robert, let's just take mine because it's different and build my list build my arc from my chart here okay so we're going to start with saturn because it's two degrees 53 minutes capricorn it's the planet of earliest no it isn't mercury is planet mercury is at zero degrees sad so that's the first one so you would start with your list would be mercury at zero degrees and then Saturn at two degrees Capricorn, and then the North Node at three degrees Libra, and then you've got Pluto, I guess. Let's see. Pluto Pluto's and Jupiter at, at five. Uh, where? Are you? Yeah. Okay, that comes first. Jupiter at five. Right, at five oh one comes first. Then Pluto, I guess, comes at five forty six Virgo. Then the Neptune is, oh, well, no, I guess Mars at 6 Scorpio 35, and Neptune comes next at 6 Scorpio 42, and then the Sun comes next at 654 Scorpio, and now you're looking for your Midheaven is next at 7 Pisces, and next would be your part of fortune at 9 Cancer, and then you've got... Where else? Now we're getting up. It looks like Venus soon. and the Moon, right? Would be the last two. Well, no, we yeah we got well, Venus. Chiron. We have Uranus. Chiron. We have Uranus. Yes, right. So, At- so in that case, Uranus comes before Venus. Uranus is twenty forty four minutes, Leo, and Venus is twenty fifty minutes, Virgo. So, so Uranus would come next, and then Venus, and then you would go to the Moon, I guess, at twenty five, and then your ascendant at twenty seven. You see how it works? So yes, you just perfect. Put them in, in zodiacal order like that. Your planet in earliest degree, Thomas, is zero Sag, Mercury, in Scorpio. Well, in, in the house, of, it's ruled by Scorpio in your chart. It's in Sag. So you were... <laughs> you were born to do exactly what you're doing. Mercury in Sag is... Even as a child, and, and I know that you come out of a, a, a Pentecostal kind of background, religious background, that's very much Sagittarius, but you were, you were acutely aware from birth of the higher side of, it's, it's inconceivable to think that an infant is born as a philosopher, but you were. So you were raised up in this uh, Sagittarius environment where religion, the idea of religion, philosophy, spirituality, God, all of these Sagittarian things were part and parcel of your upbringing. And so from from day one, and Jupiter is conjoined that Mercury, and that is religion. Sag is religion, Jupiter's religion. So you you have a philosophical outlook from birth and in, in insatiable curiosity about life so with mercury and jupiter right there early at the beginning of your developmental degrees you are mentally and physically traveling you're born to travel to explore to think to question to meet people in these areas about religion and philosophy and spirituality and metaphysics all of these things and it has indeed made you look what you are today as a broadcaster sagittarius long distance communications the internet all of that stuff is all symbolize in that one position with Mercury and then of course Jupiter right beside it and Sag in your sixth house of work and occupation. 
You see how this begins to work? Yeah, it's fascinating. It's amazing. Wow. what This is great. So thank you for wrapping that into a question about basically zodiacal order and how things work from that standpoint. And again, we would appreciate some of your comments. I haven't mentioned that in a while and uh, would just appreciate if you guys would help us fire that up. All the rest of the information of how to contact Robert for readings, etc. are in the show notes. And we'll see you next time on Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast with Robert Glasscock. Thanks so much for listening today. 